Welcome to Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. We're giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. And today's program, I'm going to enjoy this one because uh, I have grappled with trying to find the right definition. I've seen it in many, many books. I've talked to a number of people about what it really is, and we're going to find out about it uh, in the context of a new book that my guest, uh, the author of The Joy of, are you ready for this, folks? Imperfect Love. It's the art of creating healthy, secure, attached relationships. Securely attached, I should say, uh, using super glue if you need. Uh, Dr. Carla Marie Manley is our guest here on the program. Thank you so much for being with us, Carla. It's, it's great to have you with us. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Now, you are um, a psychologist, right? Not a psychiatrist, but a psychologist. Yes. Uh, by profession. Uh, what is it that has interested you so much <clears throat> in regards to psychology uh, that you've dove into this particular realm, which we're going to get into in just a moment? So The Joy of Imperfect Love, Richard, is my fourth book. And each one of my books has been something that called to me, the subject matter called to me based upon the work maybe I was doing in my own personal world. But also, as I have found, the more I've been in clinical practice, the more I've realized that there are certain trends that come into my office. Mm -hmm. And they might be anxiety and depression. Thus, my first book, Joy from Fear, Getting Stuck in Life. Second book, Aging Joyfully. I was running a very large women's group and was noticing that whether oh, somebody was in their late 20s or their 50s, they were having trouble with this big, you know, monster called aging. Mm. So that's where Aging Joyfully came from. Date Smart, again, led by clients who were coming into me saying, you know, I'm divorced or I'm fresh out of a relationship or I haven't, you know, don't like this online dating world. I keep getting it wrong. I keep dating the same type of person, whatever it was. And so that's where Date Smart came from, helping people understand how to date in healthy, grounded, grounded ways. And some people have said, well, the book, you know, after they've read it, it's so full of common sense. And absolutely, there's a lot of research in there, a lot of common sense. And in the digital age, we've lost our touch with common sense in so many ways. And so that's why the book, it tries to help ground. Now, the joy of imperfect love. I kept finding in the last, you know, several years that more and more people were coming to me saying, I'm not loved by my partner, or I don't know how to love my children, or I feel unloved by my friends, or I feel as though I'm in the dating world and can't find anyone to love me as I want to be loved. And the other theme that was very strong is I want to be loved perfectly. My partner doesn't love me enough or I don't love myself perfectly. And I thought, OK, this is the book that needs to be written. The Joy of Imperfect Love, mm -hmm. helping people understand from an attachment perspective which is the psychological model that we learn when we're very young, how to love and be loved by how our caregivers tune into us or don't tune into us. And it's a really wonderful, like I can talk more about that later if you want more depth to it. But I wrote it from that perspective. So even though I'm a clinical psychologist who specializes in depth psychology, more of the Carl Jung ilk, mm -hmm. this type of of doing work with couples and individuals of diving into the attachment paradigm is really beneficial because it teaches us that, and this is like the tagline for my own podcast, you do not need to love yourself perfectly to love others well. Mm -hmm. And so that's the, that's where the joy of imperfect love comes from. I'm curious, too, as what your definition of love is. There are many uh, from many different sources. Um, one in particular that I think, of course, a, a, a song a duet done by, um, uh, I believe it was um, not Placido. It was one of the opera singers, tenors, and I can't remember his name, and John Denver uh, called um, Some Say Love. 
is like a window, some say like an open door, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then you, of course, have the definition in uh, Corinthians in the Bible. And then there is what's referred to as unconditional love. Now, when you start defining it in a manner of speaking, don't you start putting conditions on it? I mean, if you if you have a list of things that say this is what love is, no matter how comprehensive it might be and expansive it might be, there are still conditions. Whereas I don't care what you do. Uh, I don't care who you are. I don't care how much money you have or what religion you belong to. I don't even care what political party or who you support. I don't care. You're a fellow human being. And you have every right to be here just like me. And we're both just trying to figure it out. Maybe we can help each other, despite those various differences that I mentioned. To me, that would be more that unconditional love. But what what are you, how do you, how do you view it both as someone who would be in relationship, marriage, et cetera, uh, but also as a as a psychologist, as one who has written these four books, in this case, obviously, The Joy of Imperfect Love. Thank you for that really detailed background. I'm not sure if it was um, Bocelli who sang that with John Denver. It might have been Bocelli. But <clears throat> regardless, that type of song, which is poetic love, I call those you know, song lyrics romantic love, poetic love. And I think they really have their place but they help gear us toward the desire for perfect love in a mm -hmm. sense. So, and then now Corinthians, Corinthians, love is patient, love is kind, love, love never fails, that sort of thing. That's more of what, and I introduce this in the book, pure love or divine love. Mm -hmm. and it's something we can aspire toward. I certainly aspire toward being able to love in that way. But the beauty of divine love and pure love is that for it, it can be a guiding light. Mm -hmm. But as humans, we will naturally fail. We will naturally be imperfect at it. So we can use it again as a North Star, but to hold ourselves toward always loving, always being patient, always being kind, always being pure. I, I know I try very hard and I fall short of that. Why? Because I'm human and naturally imperfect. So when we understand that, not as an excuse, but as the idea that we can use that again as our guiding light, but realize it is a journey. It is an evolution. As humans, I will still, when I'm on my deathbed, still be trying to love better because mm. love myself better, love others better. And you also brought up a really good point. So now let's move to, so what is love? What is my definition of human love? Okay. The definition of human love, and I just described it there in a sense, mm -hmm. is the striving to love yourself and others well, to the best of your ability, to learn and to grow from your missteps, so that you can evolve and polish a bit more the next day. Love does not involve guilt or blame. Love involves the desire to evolve. And that's why in the joy of imperfect love, there are 12 chapters. Every chapter begins with what I termed cabochon. Why did I pick the term cabochon? Cabochon is a polished gem. And I believe that we are all rough-ish gems. I certainly am still a bit rough, and I've done a whole lot of polishing. Mm -hmm. That if we embrace that idea, that if we just keep polishing, we are imperfect. Mm -hmm. We're, we're in have flaws. But let's just keep mm -hmm. polishing. And that takes so much pressure off. And if we look at our partners and our family and say, well, they're polishing too. Mm -hmm. Or... And maybe they're polishing at a different rate than I am. So we create room for the imperfection, never room for toxic behavior. So now let's move to unconditional love, segue into that. I think the term unconditional love has gotten a bad reputation because many people think it means you can abuse me. 
I will love you no matter what you do. Mm -hmm. And no matter what you do, I will be here trying very hard to be this, you know, martyr of pure love. I don't believe that that's what unconditional love is. Mm -hmm. I think unconditional love from my paradigm is that I can love you and continue to love you as I would hope the divine would always love us. But there may be behaviors that you engage in that are not tolerable, that don't align with my boundaries, with my moral compass. And then I, can, I am allowed, and in fact, it might be my responsibility to set a boundary and say, wait a minute. You've been really sarcastic with me. I feel very hurt by that. And I'm not going to continue this conversation if you're going to keep going down that road mm -hmm. because it's too hurtful for me and it really diminishes my light. So that is an example of I can still love you as a fellow human being. And I also get to love myself enough to have a very strong boundary about how you treat me. And you, in turn, get to have very strong boundaries about me being respectful to you. And so that brings me to the last piece that I think is really lovely about the definition of love that I like to use. And it's not, you've heard it from many other people well before me, but that love is action. And I talk about love is action. And I talk about this early on in the book because the book is, is like a ladder where you're, you get one step and you keep going you know, through the other steps. And why I say love is action is many people grow up in an environment where, and this applies to me, I've been through this. So, and I like sharing tiny bits of me so people know that I understand this from the inside out. Where if you grew up in a home where somebody says, and this comes with many religions, spare the rod, spoil the child. Mm. I'm, you know, hitting you because I love you. I'm terrorizing you because I love you. <laughs> Criticizing you because I love you. Then that child learns love equals beating, love equals criticism, mm -hmm. love equals, you know, feelings of unworthiness. So then you go up into an adult love relationship and you're repeating those patterns. Mm -hmm. Love is criticism, love is, you know, sarcasm, whatever it is. And yet the psyche somehow knows, no, this isn't right. And if this is love, I don't really want any of that really close to me because this doesn't feel good. Thus, the problems we have in adult relationships, many. So love is action. If mm -hmm. I tell you I love you, my actions yeah. had best correspond with that. Mm -hmm. And if I say I love you and you say, Carla, when you make fun of me, it feels hurtful. That mm -hmm. does not feel loving to me. Yeah. And instead of me getting defensive, if I really love you, I would say, Richard, could you please tell me more about that? What did I say mm -hmm. that felt hurtful to you? And you would say, yeah. oh, well, when you tease me about this, and if I love you, truly love you, and could get out of my own way, I would say, thank you so much for drawing that to my attention. I don't want to hurt you. I want you to feel safe with me. I apologize. And if I do that in the future, because, you know, my brain's a bit wired that way, please call it to my attention gently as you did now. Mm -hmm. And I will continue to work at that until I extinguish that behavior. It's my hope I don't, you don't have to call it to my attention again because it's on my radar. But if I do, please bring it up to me. To me, that's love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect love. We are talking with uh, Dr. Carla Manley. She has, uh, I, I think this is a beautiful book. It has a bunch of exercises in it for you as well. Uh, in The Joy of Imperfect Love, The Art of <clears throat> Creating Healthy, Securely, Securely Attached Relationships. Um, I share a lot about my own personal life on these programs. And one of the things that, as you were sharing this, what flashed in my mind was the example of my parents. Now, my father has uh, now for uh, a little over a year has left this planet. 
And uh, yet he left. I don't even think he was aware of the indelible. I was almost going to use the word ink. I don't know where that came from. Mm -hmm. uh, indelible mark on me. I know also on my sisters and brother, but I can't speak for them. I never heard him ever criticize or put down or joke about anything to my uh to my mother and vice versa not 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 in public not in private not in at any time and there was an example that uh my my mother gave i interviewed them back in 2015 for this program and they were share my mother was sharing this one example of how my father was towards her how much he respected her and cared for her and loved her uh, they had gone on a little road trip with her brother and some other people and i think uh they were traveling along i think it was in a van or something and they had to stop everybody needed to rest so they all stopped the van. They pulled off, I guess, into a rest stop, a secure place and so forth. And they all took a nap. And when they woke up and got ready to start out again, her brother made the comment to her, my goodness, you, wow, you really, you're really cutting those logs. You really snore. She, she turns to my father and says, I snore and he says, well, yeah, well, why didn't you tell me? He says, well, first of all, what could you have done about it anyway? And second of all, what good would it have done for me to tell you that you snore? And I thought, okay, now I'm not going to, again, it's not my story to tell of my present wife, but I know that there are little things that everyone has a uh, little irritants, if you will, that we all have in our different levels of relationship, you know. And I am, I am the same way with my present wife and even with my first wife. I never, I, I just, I, I, I would go into grocery stores. We would go into grocery stores. We would go into malls. We would go into different places. And you'd hear the husband making just the most outlandish comments even though they were trying to keep it quiet and he was having fun quote unquote saying what he was saying i'm going why would you say that to her i don't understand she's your partner she's your your teammate you know etc cetera, etc cetera. plus i also recognize the psychological impact that it would have um what is the, there's a, there's a, it's not exactly a mathematical equation. You may be familiar with this. You can, in probably 10 seconds, tear someone down and it will take 10 years to bring them back up again. I don't want to take 10 years to try to help bring that person up again. So I am not going to take those 10 seconds. My brother, my uh, my younger brother, he's the comedian in the family. He can get away with telling whatever jokes he wants. I tried once with my father a couple of years ago before his passing. Oh, he got madder than a pistol at me. I was being cute. Uh, my brother wasn't there. He wanted to know where he was. And I turned to him and said, Dad, we had to sell him to put gas in the car. He did not find that funny at all. And I apologized. <laughs> I said, hey, I, I didn't mean to make light of it. And I told him where he was and so forth. Now, fortunately, later that evening, to finish this part of the story, he came into the living room where I was making up the couch to sleep because I was there for my sister's uh, memorial. And uh, my brother got the guest room because he got there first, <laughs> which was fine. And he comes in, my brother, my father comes in up to me and he says, Hey, I want to apologize for getting upset earlier. 
And I turned to him and put my hands on his shoulders. And I said to him, I said, Dad, you will always be my father. I love you and we are good. And I gave him, I had to give him a very gentle hug because he was in his, uh, he was in his early nineties and a little on the fragile side. I didn't want to break him. Mm -hmm. And so when he did pass, I was so grateful to be able to say that there was nothing left unsaid between us. Mm -hmm. I've seen pictures of my father standing behind my mother as she is opening up, opening a gift that he gave her. And he is just beaming from ear to ear. Now, I've been told by one of my sisters that not all of his gifts were greatly appreciated, but he derived great joy of, about taking care of her, about giving her gifts and so forth. That's what I saw. That's the kind of love that I saw and that I, I do my best to emulate. But as you have already alluded to, we're missing a lot of that, even a small portion of that in our culture and society today here in, I guess, to be more specific, the United States. It may be global. I don't know because I've never lived anyplace else really for a long period of time to experience that. Do you find that one of the keys is recognizing how important the other person is to you that, you know, you've got to kind of push down the ego, push down the intellect a little bit and recognize I joined with this person way back when and reevaluating maybe why you connected with this person. I think that's a really good way of looking at it, Richard. And I think talking about pushing down the ego I think that it's good for us to have a healthy sense of self-awareness and self-esteem, but we live in such an individualistic culture, mm -hmm. competitive culture, and we often bring that into our relationships, into our intimate relationships. And when we bring a sense of right, wrong, good, bad, I'm smarter, I'm wealthier, or whatever it is, whatever you know the soup du jour is then we are naturally going to push people away. And that's why it's so important when you're in any relationship to look at what is my goal in this relationship? Do I want to own this person? Does this person want to be owned? Do I want to master this person? You know, be their master. Do I want to subjugate people? And if that's your inner mantra, then that's the kind of relationships you're going to cultivate. Mm. And unless the other person's very willing to be subjugated or whatever it is, there's going to be conflict. Mm -hmm. I really recommend that, especially in adult relationships, it's a little harder when you have kiddos, right? But even mm -hmm. with kiddos, you want to build autonomy. That we really look at our relationships, and this is where your comment about pushing the ego down makes so much sense. Because if I want to join with my partner, if I want to be a team member, if I truly want to be a partner, my ego needs to leave the room. His ego needs to leave the room. And we need to make a concerted effort to attune to each other. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the beauties of the attachment theory is that it's all about attunement. So if I'm coming home from work and I'm exhausted and my partner says, you know, Let's have a highly intellectual conversation. And I say, I'm a little bit weary. Can we have, you know, an intellectual conversation Saturday morning on a walk, right? I'm a little bit tapped out. That person will attune to me and say, oh, I see you are tired. I'm kind of craving this conversation. But yes, I can absolutely wait until Saturday until we can go on a walk and explore that what would you need right now? And I might say, oh, I need a cuddle or, mm -hmm. you know, you can sing me a song or whatever it is. So that's the part. But the person who's saying, let's have an intellectual conversation, that ego would need to come down a little mm -hmm. bit. And it, 
in order to do that. And sometimes we, so it's that marching, not of, oh, you're stupid for not having an intellectual conversation with me, but, oh, I see you're tired. Mm -hmm. And so I think when we do that with anyone around us and say, for example, if you're in a relationship and your partner comes home and is criticizing you and you simply say, this doesn't feel good, feels like you're pushing me away, I'm going to go and take a little walk, have a time out here. It's that part, and that's where the imperfection part comes in. Mm -hmm. Once we really realize what di dynamics are going on underneath, the ego, the fragile ego, whatever's happening, mm -hmm. that we can get out of the way of the self, out of the way of the ego, and really try to come from a place of love. And Richard, I say this in my book, most every action we do in life, this is what makes it so easy, is either going to be a reach toward or a push away. Mm. And when we break it down to that, and I was listening to you as you were talking about your mom and dad, it sounds as if their relationship was full of reach toward after reach toward after reach toward, maybe some neutral moments, but no push aways that I was picking up. And so if we're in a relationship where we're constantly pushing our partner away by criticism, by being on our cell phone when they're trying to talk to us, by not picking up our share of, of the emotional load or the physical load, then we want to look and say, well, what's my definition of love here? Mm -hmm. If I'm not willing to, or my partner is not willing to reach toward me to create balance and fairness, and there's so much research out there that a few of the things that really make a solid relationship aside from working on friendship is balance in the relationship, mm. gratitude in the relationship, mm -hmm. appreciation. And so that's, you know, it's almost its own chapter where I talk about how important it is to feed and care for our relationships. And that's one of the things about perfect love because we see all of these carefully curated images in social media about this perfect couple and the perfect kids and the perfect love. And we say, oh, but my relationship takes work. So my relationship is broken. Well, what you're seeing are tiny little snippets from somebody's life that on the inside may or may not be healthy at all. We don't know that. And it's really not our business. Mm -hmm. What we want to do is look at our relationships and say, am I caring for my relationship? Am mm -hmm. I tuning it up? We know that our cars need oil changes and gasoline. Why don't we realize that our relationships also need at least that much maintenance, but certainly more that we want? And when we shift that into a liability, oh, God, I have to maintain my love relationship. I have to talk to my partner. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God, I have to go on a walk with my partner. Ugh. And make it into a joy that ah, I have this person to walk with. I have this person to feed. I have this person I can get to do their laundry. My God, what a blessing that is. Mm -hmm. They get to fold my clothes or what. And, and when you change it into a joy, that's where the joy of imperfect love comes from. When we learn that it is a joy and a privilege to have love in our lives. Why wouldn't we want to maintain the you know, relationships? It's a matter of perspective. Yes. I know that over the a final maybe year, year and a half of my father's life, my mother had to take care of him. Now he was he was still um, I think the right word is ambulatory. He could he could walk at a little stability, but he was still moving around and carrying on and so forth. But I could see, uh, I believe it was um, probably maybe slightly before, but on the day of my, my eldest sister's memorial, uh, he was done. Mm -hmm. He was done. A matter of fact, I still remember <laughs> two phrases. And you hear this, I'm sure, from, from parents of, uh, who have lost children, that parents aren't supposed to bury their children. Mm -hmm. was one and then my mother shared with me a conversation she had with him where he said i'm tired i i just i don't i just don't want to be here anymore now my mother 
uh, shared how healthy he was. Now, he had just had a physical. In spite of his low vision, his instability, and the hearing aids, the man had, as she put it, the blood pressure of a 20-year-old. So she turns to him with that comment of his and says, okay, so what are you going to die of? Just trying to put a little lightness into it. But I also know, too, that it was hard on her caring for him because that certainly wasn't necessarily what she had signed on for. And yet at the same time, it was because as they shared in the interview, I can't believe it's been almost 20, uh, 10 years. Um, I have his back and he has mine. That was one of the things that she said. And I just, I thought, wow. And I have to be honest with you. I, I was that way up until my, my divorce uh, from my first wife, who by the way, was totally blind. Mm -hmm. And it was a very unique situation because uh, at that time I did not drive. I was legally blind and could not for the life of me uh, get the uh, DMV to give me even a license to operate a moped that only went 25 to 30 miles an hour. But anyway, I, I also wanted to ask you, and this ties into one of two things I wanted to talk about uh, as we are uh, here with um, Dr. Carla Manley, author of The Joy of Imperfect Love. I wanted to ask you about, and, and you sort of alluded to it a little bit, <clears throat> two things, and I'm going to mention them both right now, but I want to touch on the first one, and that is taking care of self, even in a loving, a love relationship, how important that is. And then the other one is, I want to talk about uh, the word perfection, but let's talk about self-care and how important that is not not in my mother's situation as the caregiver in the last year of my father's life but just in general that i remember my father would go off this was when i was much younger still living at home he would go off with uh, a couple of his buddies we called them uncles uh uncle ray and uncle harry uh and they would go out into the desert with a uh, cooler filled with ice and beer and they would have cigars and this and that and they would go out into the desert uh for a weekend camping out a you know and it was just like a normal thing i mean it wasn't all the time you know maybe once every i don't know three to six months or what have you and i know that my mother did something similar in that regard uh as far as um uh i'm sure spending time although i don't really recall specific instances where she just took off. Well, I don't mean just took off, but you know, uh, Hey, I'm going to go visit with the girls or this person, this friend, what happened. How important is that even in an imperfect love relationship? Very good question. It's always important. And so it's so important, Richard, that that's the first, almost the first half of the book. The first half of the book is about the self because it's not about the self in a narcissistic or self-absorbed way. It's about the self going back to my tagline. You don't need to love yourself perfectly to love your, to love others well. But what we do need to be able to do is to be self-aware. If we don't work that muscle of self-awareness, then we cannot, A, see ourselves, what we truly need, who we truly are. Mm -hmm. And if we cannot see that, even through a somewhat imperfect lens, we're not going to be able to attune to and see others and properly care for them because we'll be coming from a, a place of a distorted lens of the self. So self-care, I believe that but let's look at what self-care means in today's world. In today's world, self-care means more of what you were talking about, that you have these scheduled time off that feels relaxing and rejuvenating. And yes, that is ever so important for work-life balance, for overall mental health, 
for reducing stress and the cortisol and adrenaline levels that come with, you know, a stressful life. So self-care, making dates on the calendar for, you know, ideally every day you're doing something that is calendared for self-care, mm -hmm. 10 minute meditation, a half hour walk, you know, 20 minutes of journaling, something that feels like it's your restorative safe place. And if we can do that every day, what we're saying to the psyche and to others who may be in relationship with us is that I matter, my well-being matters, my physical, mental, emotional health matter. So I think that's a really key part of self-care. If we look at the bigger picture of self-care, of the whole being, body, mind, and spirit, I think we can take self-care and expand it to what I was discussing earlier. Mm -hmm. For me, being able to really know who I am, what makes me tick, what, what I'm doing well at in life, where I can polish, that's part of my natural self-care. And it was interesting that I didn't know I had lost in Carl Jung's world, he has this one quote, and I'll paraphrase it. He who looks outside dreams, he who looks inside awakens. Mm. And so I think it's important for all of us to be able again to reflect inward. And why is that necessary? When we think about the myth of, of where narcissism came from, narcissus was so focused on the external and his gaze in the pool, his beautiful reflection, that he could not hear or attune to love or to anything else. And he eventually died. And I think our society is in that place in many ways where we've become so attuned to looking outward that we forget that need of the psyche to reflect inward, to make that soul food. And I think when we start adding that to our self-care package, and here's a piece I was talking to a, a woman who knows me quite well, and I was saying, you know, I'm just not feeling as restored on my morning walks. She will tell me about them. And I told her, you know, I'm listening to, you know, the Economist podcast and this and this. She goes, okay, there you go, you have it. You're not relaxing. She said, oh, but if I don't listen to my podcast in the morning, I never get a chance. She said, take your first half hour of your morning walk and use it just to tune in deep. Listen to the birds, let thoughts come up or not. And so now my first half hour, I'm back to doing what I was doing originally. Mm -hmm. which is nothing in my ears. And there are days where I'll say, no. Nope. I don't want a podcast in my ears. This is just perfect as it is. Just the bird song, just the self-reflection, just whatever's happening. And so I think when we realize that we have an internal world and that may be foreign to some people, some people may be very afraid of their internal world or never have really gone there. And it might feel scary at first to dive into it, but the truth is, I truly believe that the internal world wants nothing from us but for us to be our best selves, for us to evolve. So once we get used to going in there, you, it's like you have this best friend waiting inside of you who really <laughs> wants to guide you and help you on your way. And we often forget about that person or never knew that person. And so to me, that's an element of self-care that is often overlooked, that self-reflective time. And for people who know about self-reflection, they may be going, oh, well, that doesn't make sense at all. Of course, there are no people out there who don't know how to self-reflect. Oh, yes, there are people out there where, and it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's just that it was modeled for you. Mm -hmm. And truly, there is an entire world within that um, has a lot to tell you, a lot, a lot of wisdom to share. Well, the beautiful thing uh, is that uh, the universe certainly guides this program and uh, the conversation because you're you're tapping into one of the other areas that I want to talk about. I still want to talk about perfection, but one of the things that we promote on this program, Doctor, is um, spending time during this the decade of perfect vision the 2020s, 
spending time going within and listening to that still small voice and the interesting I don't want to call it irony. Coincidence is I refer to my still small voice as my friend. Mm -hmm. And the more I listen, the easier it gets to listen. Mm -hmm. The more I avoid the external distractions and that is not to say that I haven't, um, oh, how do I put this, uh, grappled with some of the guidance. No, no, wait a minute. That's a totally in opposition to my, to my plan, to my plan, the ego. All right, I'll, I'll do it anyway. And then after, uh, you know, after the fact, I'm going, oh my Lord, am I glad I followed that because if I hadn't, things would be a whole lot worse right now. So I've learned that it is better to listen and follow the promptings than not. Uh, not to say that the voice would not be there. Uh, if I didn't listen the first time, okay, then let me give you some direction now, now that you uh, have, you went your own way, which is fine, you know, Um. So we, we encourage people to do that all the time, which is all part of that self-reflection, all a part of, of getting to know the real self within. But the part I want to talk about now is obviously in your title, Imperfect Love, The Joy of Imperfect Love, which by the way, folks, is the title of the book, The Art of Creating Healthy, Securely Attached Relationships. Once again, our, our guest is Dr. Carla Marie Manley. And um, I remember, um, by the, I worked for 15 years at a Christian radio station in the 80s and early 90s, in the height of televangelism. Oh, what a time. Great education I was paid for. I was the best education I was ever paid for. Anyway, I remember reading in the New Testament, uh, Jesus says, be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And I thought, what does that mean? Be ye perfect, be good, be righteous, be all, you know, I, I went through a lot of different things and I started doing some research on the word uh, in my, in my concordance, one of those giant books, you know, the strongest concordance that I had. And I came to this conclusion, at least for myself. Perfection has nothing to do with light and dark, good and bad, right, wrong, good or evil, it has to do with what, how God refers to God, self, primarily in the Old Testament. I am. I am that I am. And I thought, well, then that's perfection. Because God is neither good nor bad, at least if, if we look at it. Now I look at it from more of a metaphysical perspective, but needless to say, it's just being who I am. But how do I know who I am if we go back to going within and listening to that still small voice? How do I know who I really am? Talk to us about that aspect of self-care because it's kind of they're kind of tied together when it comes to being in relationship. Oh, great, great topic, great focal point. And coming from that place, going back a bit to what you had said previously, there are so many times, which is why self-reflection is so important, that we as individuals unconsciously get in the way of what is best for us. We do it unconsciously. So I developed a little saying for myself that is may my will of wanting not interfere with what the universe wants for me. Mm. And that's natural for us to want as human beings. We see a berry, you know, we see a flower, we want it, it's pretty. And sometimes it's not what is best for us. So there are sometimes we say, oh, I want this 
person in my life. I want this man and I want this woman. I want this career. And let's go back to that voice. Sometimes that will of wanting is not what the universe wants for us. So if we slow down and listen to that inner voice and people will say to me, yeah, I know what you're talking about, that voice, but I don't know how to tell that voice from my voice, mm -hmm. from my ego voice. And what I say, this is my findings in life. The ego voice tends to be very loud and insistent. The inner voice, the intuition voice, the divine voice, unless you're in danger, like in danger of getting hit by a car, it won't scream at you. Yeah. That inner voice tends to be, because it wants us to have will, it wants us to have choice, it tends to be very soft, very gracious. Hmm. And it may be gently insistent, as in it will come up again and again. But that's how I guide people to notice the inner voice, which is why stillness is so important. Mm -hmm. And it's so amazing to me that even in the smallest of ways, that voice is so helpful. There are times where I'm about to leave for something and something will say, turn around and look at your calendar. And I'll say, I'll turn around and look at my, and I look and I go, uh oh, I was about to escape on an appointment. <laughs> and, you know, no, right? So we want and many, many examples of that. So if we learn to listen to that voice, it will guide us toward, let's go toward Jesus now, and that, you know, that idea of perfection. I think Jesus was also so imperfect and let us know that he was imperfect. So even if, I mean, he, he made mistakes, he okay. had, he had hurts, he had wounds, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Right. If he were perfect, he would be saying, yep, yeah, time to kill me. Here I am. Let's go forward. Right. Yeah. This is for the greater good. I am perfect. This is good. Mm -hmm. but no, He was human, which is why we can identify with the figure of Jesus. Yeah. We can see that glimmer, that beauty, that hope of the divine, of what we could be if we weren't human. <laughs> and also see how, you know, there are moments when you're reading the Bible, and I see more images than words, of what a gorgeous figure of love he modeled. And some people around him model just this beauty, but also all the stories are rife with imperfection and people whose imperfections did not interfere with him loving them. In fact, their imperfections were sometimes, and I'm not, you know, a, a biblical scholar, right? <laughs> so some of this I might be a little bit off on, but you see, you know, how he loved and forgave a prostitute all of these things, seeing that mm -hmm. just because we're imperfect doesn't mean we're not lovable. It can make us eminently even more lovable. Yeah. That all that we are asked to do is if our imperfections are harming the self or others, tweak them to avoid causing further harm. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we're, we're asked to do, we're called to do. Why else are we here if not to polish that imperfect stone of the self? Mm. And I think for me, it might not be the same way for everyone. I love to evolve. It's my way of being. I love doing better. <laughs> I love saying I'm sorry and learning what I did wrong and what I could have done better. I love that. And I also love when something comes up in me, a little bit of pride, and I, and I have to work against it to say, ah, oh, I did get that. You know, most of the time I'm like, oh, I don't know that. Or, oh, yeah, you, you thank you for that information. But sometimes if it's a particular area, I might be like, oh, I got that a bit off and I'm a little bit embarrassed or whatever it is. And then I love working through that and just being able to notice that the ego is there for a moment. And then I can say, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you for bringing that to my attention and breaking through that crust of the ego. And I like those moments too. And my, some of those are my favorite because it feels like I'm learning something, like I'm growing a part of the self. Yeah. And so I think when we can break through that, what I'm calling today, the crust of the ego, it seems so perfect for some reason, that, that we know that we're learning, mm -hmm. that we're polishing. Mm -hmm. And 
polishing the stone of who we are is no one promises that it will be easy. Could you imagine if you were a diamond being polished and you were able to feel all of that polishing? And all, I mean, that would that would be quite a lot yeah, to feel. Be. Yeah. Yes, it wouldn't feel yeah. always good. And that is where we often get it wrong in today's world. We expect everything to feel good, to be a quick fix, to be easy. Self-work is some of the hardest but most rewarding work. And there are times it's painful. There are times when you, mm -hmm. you're in that period of the dark night of the soul and you're like, will I ever get out of this? And you will. Yeah, yeah. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the neighbors that we grew up next door to when I was a kid growing up uh, were into scouting and everything. And of course, uh, they had uh, what I think you would call a rock polisher. Uh, it was a small, sort of the equivalent of a little cement mixer. And you would toss all of your rocks in there and you turn it on and it moved slowly. Well, it didn't move fast. And I think you had to leave it in there for, uh, I guess, uh, several days. And when you opened it, when you turned it off and you opened it up, all of the rocks, the pebbles, whatever you put in there were all smooth because they were they were being smoothed by the other just I used rocks and that's part of the process of this existence mm -hmm. of this life that we have been given is uh, how would we ever be as you i love you you use this analogy how could we ever be polished if we lived as i use the analogy of uh uh, the fact that I know that there are sufficient class M planets in the universe that all 8.1 billion people could inhabit by themselves their own planet. But the reality is that's not the way it is. We're all here together in the same rock polishing machine, shall we say. <laughs> and so I think that it's extremely important that we all recognize that yes you can have these as you talk about uh these um healthy securely attached relationships uh, as you write about in the joy of imperfect love and you refer to it as an art you refer to it as an art it is not it is not a science i mean yeah you could probably pull from all of the different psychological from your 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 uh, uh, area of expertise uh, all the different psychological sources that are available jungian and freudian and whatever other you know sources there are uh, socrates and the list goes on but it's it's not a science because no one solution is going to work for every body because we're all different and we're all unique. And I think that's one of the things, too, that if we could just get to a space and a place, even with the narcissists, we could get to a place and say, you know what? You are important. You are necessary for my polishing. I, matter of fact, and I'm going to share this very quickly because we're just about out of time. In 2016, I got sucked into the political thing took me six months to get unsucked and I went through four stages. The first was the hardest and I had to verbalize it out loud and saying, teacher, oh, I don't want to say teacher, teacher, thank me. Thank you for teaching me how not to be. Mm. Then the next question was, um, I forget, or the next statement was, I forgive you. But more importantly, I forgive myself for allowing myself to be uh, dragged into this quagmire. The third was, what is it that you are so afraid of that makes you behave this way, that makes you speak this way? I'm not asking you to change. I just want to understand for my own growth, my own polishing. And the final one was given to me by one of my guests. Three simple words you have to mean it i love you hmm. you have a right to be here just like me you're doing your thing just like me and you are helping me to know self better and um 
you know, I hope that helps some folks. You know, there are days when I I I look at that teacher and I think, is this person ever going to learn? And it's like, what difference does it make? Or am I learning? Am I learning? And we have learned a lot from you, uh, Dr. Carla Manley. I want to thank you so much for being with us here on the program. I always enjoy these kinds of conversations uh, and going in depth like this. I wish we had more time, and I'm hoping maybe we can have you back. Uh, do you have a, a fifth coming book? <laughs> <laughs> I, we already have your fourth coming book, the one we're talking about. I have about 20 books in my head and two already in the works. So there is, I would love to come back. Um, but yes, I was born to write. I was born to help others. And mm. the um, divine just keeps coming through me, asking me and helping me write. So I'm just so blessed. And I do want to also say one thing to wrap up what you said previously. Mm -hmm. The reason science can inform us, and we often think that, you know, there's science out there that knows all, that ends all, everything answers all the question. World of psychology, the world of medicine, most of these worlds are not hard sciences. And we must look at the individual. It's the same with the medical world. As much as people want to believe that there's this rock hard science behind it, no, there's not. There's a lot of studies paid for by a lot of companies that want you to believe that their studies are, are on point. But when we realize that what we need most mm -hmm. in this world is seeing the individual, tuning into the individual, whether I'm working with an individual client or a couple or a group, or whether you're going to see the doctor, you are an individual who is precious and priceless. And you deserve to have whoever is caring for you or who you are caring for. There is that right and responsibility of tuning into that individual, tuning into yourself, tuning into others. And when we do that, we will help ourselves and many others along the way because no two of us are alike. We have many, mm -hmm. many similarities, but we are all very different from the inside out. Well, I want to thank you so much for being here on the program. I do have three final questions that I'm going to ask you in the last minute or so. Uh, and I thank you so much for being with us. And the first of those three questions is, who is uh, Carla Marie Manley? Wow, she's a work in progress. That's who she is. She <laughs> is a shining light with so much um, in her heart and just so much left to do on the planet and so many things, so many things. What is it that gets you up in the morning? I would have to say love. Love gets me up in the morning. And finally, what was your best day? My best day ever? That's a really good question. I've never thought of I don't really have a best day because every day is so different for me and so beautiful. And I wake up with such gratitude and such hope to make a difference in the world, which is why I say that's what, you know, that's what I wake up for. I believe that I'm called here to be a force of love in the world. And so I think every day in its own way is my best day. Once again, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Dr. Uh, Carla Manley. We will have your website up and link to it so people can find out more. I thank you for listening to and watching Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World, where we're giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. And until our next broadcast, podcast, video cast, love to law. Jeanette, I am still listening. Dad, continue to be happy. I am. Smokey, I'll see you on the other side. And to my dear friend Zorro, Aho, aho.